every single person, there was always something that we experienced early on that gave us that uh, motivation. John Lewis had already applied to Troy <laughs> State University, okay? And so therefore, his challenge to the system in the heart of Alabama had already started before he came to college. Okay, the library, for example, in his community. He had already attempted to use the library and get a library card. I had actually, at uh, age seven, okay, sat on the lunch counter stools at the restaurant in my neighborhood, age seven. I was Mr. Coffee before Mr. Coffee came, okay? I used to go around and take orders. Dr. When I was at age seven, I was Mr. Coffee. I would go around and take orders from the various uh, uh, merchants there in Tampa, Florida, where I grew up in Ybor City. And what I did was uh, uh, go to the restaurant, and then I ordered the coffee and brought it back to the merchants while they were still opening their shops for the day. So I was up, you know, at 5.30 every morning as a young, you know, before I went to school. So I had my own little business that I operated. And I would charge 10 cents for the coffee and 10 cents for me. It was high, expensive, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, that was the only source of, you know, coffee they could have, because they didn't have these coffee machines and stuff like that. But I got to be very friendly with the merchants, and, you know, they had their businesses and I had mine. Okay, so that was like a support. Well, while I was waiting for the coffee order to be filled <coughs> at the restaurant, the, um, I would lean against the uh, stools. And eventually I slid up on, you know, put one hip on the stool, and then I put the other hip on the stool, and I was sitting uh, erect, you know, on the stool. And the, our eyes met in the mirror, the fellow who was fixing the coffee. Of course, the place was closed because I was there before they opened. And we looked at each other, and I never will forget that look. And he looked, uh, turned his head and looked at the window to make sure nobody was looking. But I continued to talk. And that's one of the key things in uh, nonviolence. You never allow the person to think of you as nothing uh, less than a human being. So by talking and continuing to communicate, you force them to accept you as a human being. Because you feel close to your dog too, but your dog doesn't talk to you uh, regularly, you know. <laughs> so uh, as a human being, you have that kind of communication. That's why segregation was always horizontal. Because when people sit down like on the airplane, on the bus, or sit down next to you or somewhere nearby in the restaurants or something, uh, lunch counter, invariably you start talking. If someone's sitting next to you to lunch counter, start communicating. And so standing up, it, it isn't necessarily the case because you're moving, and if you're moving from one place to another, whatever. But if you stand up too long together, you still start some kind of conversation. 
So uh, that sitting down was the key thing and talking. So this fellow looked at me, I looked at him, and from that point on at age seven, I was sitting in. So when he talked about the sit-ins and stuff like that, et cetera, you know, I didn't, I, I got served coffee, but I was part of my business. I never did drink the coffee in the place, but those stools were not unfamiliar to me at all. And I, I knew how to balance myself on the stool, in other words, yeah. personal triumph against segregation. What's the most, what's the strongest memory that you have about the Freedom Ride? Well, the um, strongest memory I had about the Freedom Rides was when we were attacked in Montgomery, Alabama on the, uh, at the bus station. We had arrived in Birmingham in order to continue the Freedom Rides, and we stayed all night in the bus station because no bus driver would drive us uh, to Montgomery. In fact, when the bus uh, it was scheduled to go, and uh, you know, arrived, when we stood in line to get on the bus, I remember the bus driver saying, uh, uh, any of you from, from, from CO, that they knew about the Congress of Racial Equality, because they called it CO. We didn't say anything because we weren't from CO. He say, if any of you from the NWACP, the NWACP, no, we're not from that, no. Uh, he said, well, I got one life to give, and I'm not going to give it to the NWACP or co. So we stood there, and he got his little change uh, machine and got off the bus, refused to drive. And uh, so we stayed in the bus station all night in Birmingham, and the Ku Klux Klan, that's when I met them face to face for the first time. They were walking around the uh, bus station, and occasionally they would stomp our uh, feet, and then they would throw cold water on us. Because, you know, at all, all, all night, you know, we took naps and stuff, and so they kept us awake. And uh, one was kind of shocked because when he threw the cold water on me and I woke up, I said, thank you. Yes, because we needed to stay awake and watch them. <laughs> so <laughs> we needed to, <laughs> so I really appreciated him <laughs> keeping me because if I had been asleep, he could have, you know, injured me or something. <laughs> but I needed to watch. So I thanked him and he was kind of confused. They didn't throw any more water on us because <laughs> they didn't realize they were helping in some way. But uh, we finally uh, got an arrangement where the uh, bus company and the federal government, uh, Robert Kennedy, arranged and got a special bus for us. It was going to take us all the way to New Orleans. When we found out they were going to take us nonstop to New Orleans to end this Freedom Rides, we went, because we had interstate tickets, we went back and got one-way tickets to Montgomery. So had they taken us any further than Montgomery, it would have been kidnapped. So we arrived at the bus station. We had all kind of, uh, all along the highway, all kind of protection. Helicopters, you know, uh, trucks, you know, with troops on them and that kind of stuff, et cetera. When we got to the bus station, uh, within a block or two, that was, it was on a Saturday morning, no traffic, nothing. We didn't see anything but the policeman. And that's a busy time uh, of the week on Saturday when the farmers bring food back and people, you know, people bring, they do shopping and stuff like that. A lot of commercial things, nothing. So the bus cruised on in 
to the bus station with only one policeman now in front. We got there. I stood up as we were going towards the bus station and told the Freedom Riders, since I was the spokesman for the second group that was going in, and we joined up with the first group. So I was one of the spokesmen. John Lewis was a spokesman for the first group. I said, all right, I want everybody to get a partner. Could be your seatmate or somebody that you feel comfortable with. Stay with that person. Don't let them out of your sight. Stay together. And uh, no matter what happened, somebody will know what happened to you. So we stepped off the bus. Um, we didn't have the, the rides that were supposed to have been waiting for us. John Lewis had the book, and he knew what the schedule was. There are people who were supposed to have been there to take us, you know, uh, to someone's home or take us to the church. Yeah. Nothing. There was one driver, cab driver, who was black, and he was there. And so um, we saw him beating up the... Um, the, the media, they start uh, knocking people down. These are all white. And this mob came out of the bus station, just uh, kicking people and smashing cameras in their faces and stuff like that. And we knew we were going to be next. Cause they were just wiping the media out so that they could get to us next. So I told the... Uh,